distinctions are blurrier and I think that's both great and dangerous. <laughs> I think sometimes people don't know the difference between when they're being sold to and when they're just being told a story or being educated. So I, I do think that it's, it takes a savvy consumer. We're going to get started with our content in a post-digital world panel. Thank you for coming here today. We're excited to talk with you over the next 55 or so minutes. When we talk about the notion of post-digital, what we're really talking about is a world where everything is matched up. Um, when we were prepping for this event, we were talking about integrating content into digital, but we quickly, quickly realized that it's not about traditional or digital anymore. It's really about a post-digital world where this digital distinction is really vanished in our lexicon. So we'll go down the, the line and introduce who we are, and we'll start with Rob. Um, Rob Sheard. Um, I'm the SVP of the Partner Studio at Zero Point Zero Productions. So we're a New York-based production company that does shows like Andy Bourdain's Parts Unknown, uh, Meat Eater, Mind of a Chef. Uh, we've done several films over the last couple of years. Uh, the most recent one was called Wasted, which was a food race documentary that debuted at Tribeca. And then we have a hunting doc that's hopefully going to be out on the festival circuit next year. But we do a wide variety of you know digital publishing. We own the website Food Republic. We do a food magazine called Cured have a, uh, a couple podcasts and things like that. But thanks for coming out on a, a sunny Saturday. I'm Lauren Priscillo. I'm the managing editor of digital content for the history series American Experience, which was actually produced right out of this building at WGBH um, for distribution on PBS stations across the country. And I work with a smaller team within the larger production unit. American Experience as a series produces about eight feature length historical docs per year and my team produces digital content, everything from short form video to articles to visual content that we distribute across all digital platforms more on a 365 day per year calendar. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Keith Orlowski, I lead up our content practice at Digitas LBI. Um, I was gonna say we're a digital agency, but I feel like that doesn't really mesh with the panel. Uh, so we're, we're a marketing advertising agency. Um, I lead our Boston and Detroit region. We have offices all over uh, North America. And about two years ago, just with the influx of the word content, um, we developed Digitas Studios, which is our solution to content. So um, I don't like to call it branded content because um, it kind of cheapens it, I think, a little bit. Um, but we do it for a variety of clients um, uh, globally. And I'm Mike Peru. I am from Hill Holiday, also a marketing agency. Our, I lead our innovation and technology function, uh, which uh, is all about what's next in digital strategy, creative technology, editorial, as well as digital production and customer experience. So just a, a few things. We've organized the talk today into four main parts. We're first going to talk a little bit about the content landscape and what's going on there to really set the stage for this. The second part will be about content strategy. How are we approaching making the right things? Part three, we'll get more into production and how we're learning to produce more with less. And the last part is all going to be about distribution and the role that media is playing as a vital part of making sure that what we all make is getting out into the world and seen and experienced. And then uh, we'll open it up for questions at the end. Throughout today, we will be sharing some clips of some content that each of us have produced or been responsible for, so we'll pepper those in over the course of the next 50 or so minutes. So we'll get right into it, um, starting first with the content landscape. And I think the, the first question for, for all of us is, what is content going into 2018? Keith, why don't you start since you are the head of content? Yeah, exactly. I think it's the most overused word. I think content and strategy, which I think are both in our, our panel, are the two most over, overused marketing words. But the way that we like to define it is people first stories um, that consumers seek out, shape, um, share, and choose to spend time with. And I think it's really important that stories stay a part of that because I think content is very different than advertising. I'm the sort of anti-advertising guy at our agency, so a lot of people hate me. Um, <clears throat> not really, um, but I don't think, maybe. Um, but uh, it, it really is about being invitational in nature, right? And so in this world, this sort of post-digital world where um, people can choose to turn off commercials, um, and many of them are, right? With Netflix, SVOD services, 
um, with the newsfeed environment with their mobile phone and just being able to point and click and search for whatever it is they want. Um, they don't have a need for um, brands to be pushing sort of advertising and, and interruptive advertising. And so, you know, the two most important components I think of that definition are they need to be stories. Um, that's really important, right? Um, and they need to be invitational in nature. Lauren, some might say that anything that gets produced is content, and that would also include advertising. What's your take on that? Um, I, I do think those worlds are merging. You know, if you had asked me that, you know, five years ago, would I say, I think there was a brighter line between the two, and I might have made more of a distinction. Um, but obviously right now, people are looking at brand association, and that, that I, I think you're very, it's smart to be pointing out storytelling. I think that is what brings people into content. That's what makes people stick around. And you know that's what we do at American Experience. That's kind of what's been at the heart of the documentaries that the series has made for going on 30 years. And making sure that that tenant of storytelling is deeply embedded in everything that we're producing for the digital space is um, really at the heart of what, of what we do. So the distinctions are blurrier, and I think that's both great and dangerous. <laughs> I think sometimes people don't know the difference between when they're being sold to and when they're just being told a story or being educated. So I, I do think that it's, it takes a savvy consumer to differentiate between those two. But you know, if you're telling a story and it's a great story and someone learns something, is that a bad thing? Right. No. <laughs> right. so. And some might argue that um, marketing, which has always been about storytelling, advertising is a story. Um, mm -hmm. So it is. I think the lines are blurring a whole lot. Rob, in your world, what are you seeing as some of the biggest opportunities uh, for, for content uh, in, in today's modern era? I mean, I think it really comes down to the audience has more control over how they watch things and what they watch than they ever have before. And uh, as everyone's saying, you know, during a traditional 30-minute television show, there were 14 to 16 30-second commercials being played. And I think everyone, whether you're on you know, the broadcast, the cable side, whatever that end of the business, everyone knows that's not going to continue with cord cutting and all of the, you know, the retransmission fees and all of that. Or, you know, the cable operators are looking to cut a huge amount of costs. And so they're all looking for new ways that they can still afford to put on good television and compete with, you know, the Netflix, the Amazons, the Hulus, the Facebook Watch, everything that's, you know, a content player now. Um, you know, I, I think what it really comes down to is um, finding ways to connect with the audience. And then the second part is really finding a way to pay for it. I think um, as far as more subscription services coming to the world, like people, you know, how many more $9.99 a month charges do you need to see on your credit card as far as just to be able to watch that, you know, Hans Made's Tale or the show that you didn't even know existed or things like that. So, I mean, I don't think it's ever been kind of more competitive for uh, the audience eyeballs and engagement than it ever has been and, and that's a good thing because quality's certainly gone up and I think you know when you look at like how people are spending their free time and discretionary income if you look at like the summer box office it was a disaster as far as like traditional films now a lot of that can go into look at the films that they're making do we really need you know the fantastic four nine or whatever whatever you know marvel <laughs> thing is coming back out but i think there's so much competition from like premium television and the spot where you you know you look at I, I mean, did any movie get more buzz than Stranger Things? I, I, th there was nothing I was aware of all summer. So it is, um, you know, just uh, the audience really has more control than ever, I guess, is my take. They do. And, and first, there's always room for more superhero content out yes, there. Yes, yes. Second, <laughs> you talk about uh, connecting with audience. And Keith, I'm curious, as we head into to 2018, almost imminently, as scary as that is, what is changing about the world of content as you're planning with your own clients? I mean, I think it's scary because it's, it's like micro-targeting, right? So um, trying to reach the most minute audience. And it sort of scares me in a way because while you want to be specific with the piece of content you're putting out, it also sometimes takes away from the excitement and the, the sort of uh, glitter that you can put on um, uh, the shinier sort of object. So, it worries me a little bit, um, just in terms of like how much you can just sort of minutely target um, different audiences. 
Um, and uh, you know, I think to Rob's point, it is all about choice. Um, the consumers have never had more power than they do today. Um, and I think brands in particular, from my side of the house, uh, need to take that into account. And so while, of course, you want to sell products at the end of the day, not every single piece of content can be the hardworking thing that pulls you through and gets you to buy a product. Um, uh, there is sort of room for that, traditionally speaking, the upper funnel content to pull people in. And I think brands, because dollars are looked at so much more uh, in a microscopic way, are sort of forgetting about that um, and uh, or, or not paying as much onus to that. Um, and I think some brands are suffering from a marketing perspective. There are a lot of factors. That's not the only reason. Um, but I do think there's, there's a little bit of suffering there. There is, and you know, it not only is about micro-targeting, but I think it's also about telling stories in a shorter and shorter amount of time yeah. frame because of people's attention spans. Yeah. Um, if you want to go ahead and cue the um, Party City bumpers, one of the things that we did uh, for a Party City client, um, we just passed Halloween, we used a new media format from Google, which was six second pre-roll. So we had to tell a story within six seconds and make it compelling. So during the 30 days leading up to Halloween, um, we had one of these bumpers that acted as a countdown to Halloween. Not gonna show all 30, um, but we have a couple that we can show if we wanna roll the, the first one. <laughs> Iron Man ironing his costume, right? Who doesn't like superheroes? Um, we can show we can show one more as well. <laughs> Lauren, from your perspective, um, what do you see as the biggest threats to um, producing content at, at this point? It's what hard. keeps you up at night? What keeps us up at night? <laughs> I mean, I think one of the biggest threats that, that we see is just, as you mentioned, kind of the sheer amount of content that is out there. And how are you kind of spending your dollars and your time um, in a way that you still feel like is meaningful? I think, I don't know that that necessarily speaks to a threat, but it speaks to kind of what we want to stay true to is telling meaningful stories that we think are important. And so I think what becomes threatening is jumping on every trend or every um, change in a Facebook algorithm, or, or which is constant. And if you want to kind of hold true to these values of storytelling and meaningful content, that you kind of constantly feel like you're under attack by the way that all of these outside forces are, are kind of shaping the way that you are creating content. So. Yeah. I feel like from a creative standpoint, we don't give stuff room to breathe anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of reasons behind that, and data is great, and we have an unbelievable analytics team um, at Digitas LBI, but it's like making sure that up front the KPIs are the right KPIs, so the right performance indicators, um, and then giving it a little bit of room to breathe, right? And putting yeah. some left and right brain sort of analysis into it as opposed to it's all about engagement, it's all about, Let's you know. dive into that and then we'll now segue into the content strategy piece of the discussion um, because data is playing a bigger and bigger role into really determining what are the right things to make. So you just talked about, Keith, making sure we have the right KPIs. Mm -hmm. How, do, how does one go about doing that? What are the right KPIs? I think it's like, I mean, this is going to sound cliche, but it is a case-by-case -case basis, right? Because I think the automatic thing you go to is engagement. But engagement, Facebook, YouTube, like they all have different, slightly different metrics in terms of what a view is, right? Um, and they're a little skewed towards their platforms from a payment perspective, um, all, all those sorts of things. So I, I think you really, you know, it's a generalization to say we've gotten lazy, but I think it's like, in this digital world, well, it's all about engagement. Yeah, to an extent, but I think like digging two, three, four layers beneath that to try to get at like what is the true business outcome that we're trying to mm -hmm. to get to. Um, it, you know, um, I think we don't do it enough. Rob, from your perspective, how do you go about determining what the right stuff is to produce? You know, I think it, it starts with a great story, no matter what you're doing, whether it's a film, a television show, or anything. Um, and then tr really trying to understand as much as you can about the target audience. And really, 
talking to people, whether it's, I, I'm not a fan of focus groups, but I think online surveys are a great way and that's something that we do. So, you know, we do have our commission productions, which are shows like, the, you know, Parts Unknown, and then we have like Mind of a Chef and um, the show Meteor, which is a hunting show. And um, it's really up to us to kind of sell those, sell those shows and do the licensing deals across all the different platforms. And, you know, we have e-commerce, you have podcasts. And so we have a lot of connection points with the audience. And, you know, I think you can sometimes overthink, like, research, but, like, just asking them, hey, what did you like? Or obviously through all the social platforms, you get to hear a lot, this is what we loved or things like that. So, you know, making it, you know, very much a two-way conversation on the creative side and then, um, you know, not necessarily always doubling down on what works, but always be willing to take a risk or tell a new story as well. Like one, one thing about the, the hunting show that we produce, we'll have episodes where uh, no animals are killed, which is um, if you've ever watched any sportsman's channel or outdoor channel, like that never happens. They're kind of like, uh, you know, the, it's uh, very stereotypical of what you think a hunting show would be, but it's really about the outdoors. It's about conservation. And it's like, there's a lot more to, if you're, uh, you know, a, a hunter, there's a lot more to it than just like the, the end shot. So, um, you know, I think just looking at that and, uh, you know, listening as much as you can, whether you're a brand or you're, uh, you know, a show. I think the listening piece is super important. And, you know, it's interesting in getting some like real time signals, uh, especially when doing content for brands. Um, we could also queue up the Party City uh, trend video, either one. Um, one thing that we did was uh, to look at what was trending throughout the Halloween season and um, to turn a piece of content super quickly around to be able to inspire people to make a costume around that trend. Talk about solving for the business problem. The business problem was how can we help consumers um, realize all the accessories that Party City has to mix and match into a costume. So this is one of the trend videos that we launched. On. Um, so this is just one example of uh, when um, you know a famous coffee maker's uh, unicorn coffee was or Slurpees, whatever they were, were, were trending, um, and and what was possible in that. Lauren, getting into more um, content production. Mm -hmm. I know one of the things that, that I hear, and I bet Keith does as well from clients, is how can we be more uber scrappy about content? Nimble. nimble. That nimble. How can we be more nimble? Uh, and that means do more for With less less. money. Um, I was going to say translation. <laughs> that is How it. do we do this that for very it. little money? What are you seeing around that? I mean, I work in public television, so it's no secret that our budgets are not huge. Um, and so we are asked to do a lot and produce a lot of content with resources that are, are probably disproportionately small than you guys might see in the more commercial world. Um, and, but that's not to say that kind of our marketing team and our social distribution team has any kind of reduced appetite for the amount of content that we could give them. You know, if we could give them a new piece of content every single day, they would take it and say, do you have two? Um, and, and I understand that. Uh, but what we do at American Experience is to try to find that balance of, okay, what is kind of new production, original production that we can be doing, and how can we also be capitalizing on a vast archive of content that we have? You know, kind of what, what resources do we already have in house that we can make new and we can be thinking about for a new platform? So I think I'll have Glenn show the clip, um, the Francis Perkins clip, and this kind of speaks also to your earlier question about <coughs> what content should we be making? Um, this is a story that when I was going back through an old film, I realized that the story of Francis Perkins had been told on camera by one of the interviewees and it had never made it into the film. It's a great story about a pioneering woman that just kind of got lost in the shadows. And so our question isn't kind of what's, you know, what, uh, what is our client need, it's is this a story that should be told. And so this was something we were able to take information that was just kind of sitting in our archives um, and our producer, Eric Gulliver, who's probably somewhere in the room, producer and editor, um, 
who is incredible with graphics, who is a great editor, and who is really resourceful when it comes to finding public domain images, when it comes to finding things that, that we can kind of incorporate for little or no money other than his time to put together a really engaging video, so. So that's sort of one of those stories that was kind of living in the shadows, not only of history, but also in our archives at American Experience. It was kind of buried somewhere on an old website. Um, so for Eric to take that and give it an entirely new life that works on a Facebook platform, that works on our website, uh, that he could take some of those graphics and hand them to our social team that they could use on Instagram, you know, it just gives it kind of a whole new uh, life and opportunities for distribution. It's interesting to take something from the archives and be able to tell different stories with it, mm -hmm. purpose built for different channels that it's on. Yeah, and I mean, the, when that interview was done however many years ago for a film about the Triangle Shirtwaist fire, that obviously wasn't the purpose of the interview that we pulled the information from. Um, and obviously you don't even hear the interviewee there. It's just information that was kind of given that we had in a transcript that we could fact check, so. Rob, how are your productions getting more efficient? Um, you know, I think it kind of, to be honest, like f for someone who's in our position, I think it kind of goes both ways. For example, you know, we'll be really scrappy to produce a new podcast or, um, you know, some s so short social kinds of videos and things like that to promote a show. Um, but really, there's never been more money in the marketplace for, you know, gr high quality television with, you know, Netflix is going to spend $8 billion next year. A um, you know, Amazon's spending $3.5 billion. Facebook's coming in with over a billion. Apple's coming in with a billion. So, like, they're competing for the kinds of programming, like the traditional half-hour television or hour-long television yeah, that, we, <laughs> that we produce. So it's great, but I, I also think we're, as a company, you know, we certainly, you know, we, um, you know, we just built like kind of a, a podcast studio and it was just an extra office that we had. And um, I, I think when you talk about scrappiness, it really, a lot of it depends on the audience expectation on the platform. And you can't insult someone. Like, you know, if, if someone came to us and said, hey, we want to do a 90 minute documentary, we've got 100 grand. Like, you just have to be honest, say, you know, people have choice and they're not gonna sit and watch that shit for, <laughs> you know, if it's a poorly produced thing. You, you, there's, you, they have tons of options like we've been talking about, so. I also, I, the way I try to convince clients, and, and some of them are there, um, is I, I feel like we, we've gone from a media-led world um, and, and just because there's so much fragmentation, it's not about ABC, NBC, CBS, like there's some relevancy there, but then there's the millions of other places to really a production-led world. So if I think about, if I'm trying to make an impactful piece of content, I really should be looking at the production dollars and the media dollars as one pool. Yes. Whereas I think, traditionally speaking, it was, well, I need to spend $15 million on media because I've got to get the message out there. That's not necessarily the case anymore. So what I like to think is that we're sort of coming more towards the middle and that there is money to do um, bigger stuff. Now, like to Rob's point, if you're putting out a Snapchat filter or, um, or an Instagram story, should you be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce that? Probably not. Um, but if you are doing a big anchor piece, there's, there's rhyme and reason behind why it costs what it costs. When you talk about, Keith, combining budgets of media and production, to what degree are you personally finding that 
content is getting produced more by the media partners, um, or are you finding that you're doing more in-house at Digitas? Um, it's a good question. I think the first piece of that is, because we do media planning and buying, is do we have a media portion of the business? Because when we do, inherently there's more synergy there and there's more sort of sharing of the dollars. Um, when you don't, obviously sometimes you get into a little bit of an arm wrestling match. Um, so, you know, that sort of comes up. Now, publishers are all getting into the content business, right? T-Brand Studios and New York Times, Vox has a huge in-house branded content studio, so they're all in there. And I'm totally fine working with them, and if it makes more sense from an efficiency standpoint, um, they've all got world-class people there that many of them come from an agency background. Otto Bell, who leads Courageous Studios for CNN, came from Ogilvy. Um, so it's all sort of shared resources. And so I, I'm not as precious about it has to be produced by us. I think, you know, when it starts to get where they're running agencies and are being directly competitive, then it sort of gets a little bit uh, more awkward. I don't know if that really answers your question. <laughs> it can be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as we talk about scrappy content, one of the things we did for Planet Fitness, and we can cue the Planet Fitness dad bod video, um, is we weren't going to spend a lot of money necessarily on a piece of social media content um, that you know wasn't necessarily going to be on broadcast television, but we wanted to honor dads of all types um, in a judgment-free way for Planet Fitness um, for Father's Day. So we were really scrappy about putting together this piece of content, actually sourcing footage and getting permission from owners um, on YouTube to assemble uh, this video. Planet Fitness doesn't judge dad bods, but that doesn't mean we ain't going to stare. Oh, yeah. Because who's got time to constantly exercise when you're busy being so freaking sexy? Trim those hedges, dad. Give the ladies the view they want. Call 69% of women to say dad bods rub them the right way. Is it hot in here or is that just the perfectly seasoned salmon? Dads, you really know how to make our mouths water. And what's making a bigger splash than the beach bar? The car may need some body work, but you don't. Happy Father's Day, fellas. Hope it's as good for you as it is for us. Doesn't that make you want to join Planet Fitness? <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the role of media in your world. Um, how, how do you get people to, to see the stuff that um, you're producing, that uh, American Experience is, is, is putting on? I mean, it's, I work with a team. So I have my digital content production team that sits with us at American Experience. And then we also have our marketing team and our audience engagement team. And so we work kind of hand in hand with them. So when people ask how big our digital team is, I say, well, there are kind of four of us on the digital team. But if you expand that to the folks who are talking, who are doing social media content every day and distribution, it's really more of like a six and a half person team. And so we are working with them to say, OK, what trends are you seeing? How should we be producing this? Should this be square? Should this be, you know, all of those things that be, seem small, but they're huge when you look at what that does to consumption and you know, to engagement with your content. Um, and I mean, the sad but very honest answer is, is money. You know, if you can throw some money at this content, it's amazing how it rises up. And it doesn't even have to be huge money when we're talking public media dollars. We're, we're talking, are you boosting a post for a few hundred dollars? You know, we're not talking about, is this a $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 ad buy to be putting behind a one minute video. You know, we're really boosting this really strategically with small pots of money. <coughs> Um, so as uninspired an answer as that is, when we are distributing things on social media platforms, to be able to put at least a little bit of money and to be able to target that really well to your audiences, I, I think is huge. Because as soon as you do get a little bit of traction with that with your selected audience, um, and particularly niche audiences, they do tend to snowball and take on a bit of a life of to its own. To what degree are you finding that 
audiences are tuning in to the long form versions of American Experience on PBS or its digital properties because they are discovering bits and pieces of it in social media? I wish I had more concrete data on that. What I can tell you is that last year we reimagined what American Experience was going to look like in the digital realm, and that meant a huge increase in digital video that we are creating for distribution across social platforms and for our website. And we just learned the other day that after relaunching our website and with this new team in place that our online streaming across all video, and that includes our feature-length films, is up 20%. So whether those people are watching feature length films, which we do stream all of our films for a four week window after broadcast, or whether they're consuming these shorter form pieces, they're consuming more content period um, with American experience. I'd love to attribute that <laughs> to kind of greater content distribution across social shorter form things. It's a little bit hard to draw that line. Um, unless you can literally watch them online go from a short form video and jump right over to the to the full stream of the film um, but we would like to think that if you're sampling our content eventually you're tuning into the larger to the longer films rob what role does your company play do you play in the distribution piece of the productions that you're putting on and what are you seeing as the changing role of media in that I mean, I think media is still critical to generate awareness about any kind of a show across, you know, multiple, you know, platforms and channels. And, you know, there's a reason that Netflix runs a television commercial during an NFL game for Stranger Things is to, to drive the audience there. Um, you know, as, as far as, you know, brands producing something and then putting media dollars behind it, I think that makes a lot of sense of, of course, if they're investing in high quality content, you have to generate awareness in some way. I mean, it, you know, it all probably depends on their tactics and what, you know, what they've done in the past and if they're a direct response kind of player, you know, what their business model is. But um, no, I think, you know, promotion is incredibly critical and, um, you know, even, even traditional PR is very important. Like when we did the film Wasted, like, you know, you get the PR for three billion impressions over the, the you know, the three week kind of release window sure. and stuff like that. Like, um, you know, a New York Times review is still very important. Now you've also got Rotten Tomatoes and all of the kind of user generated reviews that are also probably more important if you, if you're, if you're being honest. But um, yeah, though, I think, I think media is, you know, in incredibly important. And I think, you know, you know, what's interesting about like the, the publisher as like an ad agency model, whether it's like a Vice or a Vox or, or different folks like that, like um, all of every time that they, they, what they want to do is create something at, at, at as low of a cost as they possibly can, and then like they're still putting tons of media dollars in to get views and eyeballs. And I think maybe some of that has shifted as the, you know the platforms have tried to create more transparency, so that you know. If that Facebook video got 1.5 million views, they know that 90% of them were, were paid. It's it's not the old, you know bait and switch like sure. the, some of those folks used to pull. So, um, you know, I think I think it, it, you know it depends if if you've if you've just produced a, a poor quality YouTube video and you're buying tons of TrueView around it. I, I I don't think there's a lot of you know return on investment on something like that though. There's not going to be, and you're, you're making the case that media still, of course, in its traditional sense, still has a role in creating awareness. I would also add, and Keith, I want to get your take on this, that more and more, media in itself is the content. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, elaborate. <laughs> I want you to elaborate. What do you think of that statement? I think it's true. I mean, let's talk about something we did for Bank of America, and we can actually queue it up. Um, this was the perfect case of a media and production merging together sort of thing. So the bank, um, Bank of America, I say the bank, Mike understands me, but <laughs> as he works, he's worked with There's them. only one. The bank. <laughs> um, they formed a consortium with a couple of the other big players basically to put together their rival to Venmo. Um, it's called peer-to-peer -peer payment. And um, this sort of insight that we discovered is a high percentage of friendships, I think it was like 53% in the survey that we did, um, there's actually tension in a friendship or it's ended over money issues. And so <clears throat> we used this idea of pay back a friend um, and actually launched Pay Back a Friend Day, which was October 17th. So if you haven't paid your friend back with the Bank of America app, do it now. 
Um, still, a, you're a couple weeks late, but it's okay. Um, and basically just played on sort of that tension in a funny way um, and sort of the immediacy that the app can play. Uh, and we want it to be as authentic as possible. Obviously, you want to be authentic when you're talking about it. So we um, looked to Jimmy Kimmel Live and sort of his group of, of friends and family and Guillermo in this case um, to sort of bring this, pull, pull this through full circle. Thanks. We are so happy to be back here in Brooklyn. I see so many familiar faces here. Guillermo, I heard you ran into an old friend today. Yes, I did, Jimmy. It was very bad. Oh, really? I'm sorry to hear that. But then it got better thanks to the help of Bank of America app. Ow! Hey, Hudson, my man. What? It's good to see you again. Oh, hey, Guillermo. What's the matter, Hudson? Remember the last time you came to Brooklyn and we went to Mustache Palooza together? Oh, yeah. It was the biggest mustache celebration of the year. And I wanted to buy a hat for my mustache. But I didn't have any cash, and you were so nice. You loaned me so money. I remember, Hudson. And you didn't pay me back. I never pay you back? You never paid me back. You say I didn't pay you back? Not ever. Never? No. And you sure? I'm sure. You didn't pay me back. I never pay you back? Nope. So what you're saying is that I didn't pay you back? No. I didn't? Nope. No wonder you don't love me anymore, Hudson. It's okay, Guillermo. It's payback a friend day. That's great, but I still don't have the cash to pay you back. Do you have a phone? Yeah, I have a phone. Just open the Bank of America app. You can use it to send money, request money, or even split a bill. I got it. And to celebrate, I got you a present. What? Yeah, here. A mustache hat. Yes. <laughs> it's perfect. I love you, Hudson. I love you, Guillermo. Can I borrow $30? Sure. You can send it to me. You know. In the Bank of America app. Yeah. yeah. I'll see that. It's time to settle up. Payback a Friend Day is October 17th, presented by Bank of America. Hey, Jimmy, are you using the Bank of America app? No, I'm buying tickets to Mustache Palooza next year, but thank you. Jimmy Kimmel Live, weeknights at 11.35, 10.35 Central on ABC. Tune in to Jimmy Kimmel Live. Um, so, it, <clears throat> a little belabored, but I do think that's media's content. So the way it's, it, the deal is sort of commissioned and struck is through um, media placement. It's an in-show integration. Um, and so I think that's one sort of example um, of how that's sort of playing out. I think what we're is, seeing that a lot, too. One of the areas where I think we're seeing it, we're not doing it yet as American Experience, but as with podcasts, um, because so many people are thinking of those not only as content, but as a brand extension. Uh, you know, Gatorade has a podcast. It, you know, many, many major brands have a podcast. Some brands within the public media world have a podcast, and obviously some of them are more, you know, if you look at something like Masterpiece, they have kind of a fan cast uh, with some of their bigger shows. and. That is one of those things that's certainly straddling both of those worlds. Podcasts are really interesting. So <coughs> whoever you're commissioning, whether it's Gimlet or um, Panoply or whomever else, to push that content, there's a way for brands to monetize through the media, which I think is really interesting. So um, GE obviously did, I'm forgetting, uh, the message. I think they've done two seasons now. Um, but they actually have the ability to monetize on the media associated with that show. So they pay for the production of the show. They push the show out. They get eyes and ears on the show. And then any of the media that's purchased to be a part of that show, that podcast, I keep saying show, the podcast, um, they're monetizing a percentage of that. So I, that's, we could go down a whole rabbit Very hole nice. there. But it's, a, it, it's an interesting sort of um, way to think about marketing and, and, and content in a way. It is interesting. What's always funny to me about um, in-show integrations like the Jimmy Kimmel example you shared is when you think about it, that's where commercials started yeah. back in the, you know, the 1930s and 40s. Yeah. I mean, that's what happened with commercials. So it's sort of like the classic what's old is new again. Yeah. When I brought up and you know, was talking about how media is content, you know, one of the things that popped in my head was um, when you look at um, social media, you look at what's going on in feed for things like Facebook. You know, Facebook, about a year or two ago, launched the idea of autoplay video. So they're almost creating like a feature set within the feed to be able to um, create content around. And the, the job there is to make it thumb-stopping, make it stand out. 
Um, one of the things we can queue up is the Planet Fitness, I think it's Facebook flash sale. Um, so this is just a really quick piece of autoplay Facebook video where we're announcing a flash sale. You know, it sounds boring by itself for Planet Fitness, but we needed to do something um, to draw attention to it. So we can play this. So this would have been auto feed. Um, it's a flash sale. <laughs> there it is <laughs> for 20, 25 cents. Who doesn't want a good flash in their, in their Facebook feed? <laughs> that is safe for work. <laughs> I want to make sure we have some time um, to start opening it up for questions. So we'll take a, a quick pause right now and open it up to the audience. I see someone with their hand raised. Just speak up and speak loudly. There may be a mic coming to you. And there it is. Make it a good one. <laughs> well, I got a couple. I'll, I'll try this one first. Um, this might be more for Rob and Lauren, but you know, Mike and Keith, you can probably jump in too. Uh, I happen to know that there's a, a director in the room today who just finished a 17-year-long feature-length documentary that is stunningly powerful <laughs> and is having a screening in a week. Um, you can just tell us where the screening is so we can get <laughs> tickets. <laughs> Go ahead. You have the well, floor. Well, that's not the point, <laughs> but um, wh what, what, what do you guys see as the market now for a one-off documentary? Coolidge Corner this Friday at noon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you start. We were talking a little bit about this before the start of the panel. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it all depends on, you know, finding the right distribution partner, the buyer for the film. And, um, you know, there's so many factors that, that go into that. I mean, really, um, you know, the documentary film market is still driven by the festival circuit and things like that. And there's so many great festivals now. Um, you know, it, it, it real, like that's that's the way that business still still works on a lot of levels. Getting into, you know, a prestigious festival, having the right connections to the to the right buyers and things like that are all um, important. That's a that's a long project, so I certainly wish you the best in <laughs> in finding the the <laughs> the right place for it. And I think it depends, you know, prior to kind of taking on the, the digital world and American experience, I did some work in this. We did some theatrical releasing of films, uh, Last Days in Vietnam, which was actually uh, uh, nominated for an Academy Award, and then Command and Control, which was shortlisted. And I think what's really important is to have a really honest conversation with filmmakers about what is your goal with this film. Is your goal to have as many people as possible see this film, or is your goal to make money? If your goal is to make money, you know, that's a unicorn with a documentary film. You know, one in a million might make money. Um, but if your goal is to have as many people see it as possible, then what you're really looking for is that sort of distribution, whether it's on PBS or Netflix or, or wherever it is. You know, filmmakers want the Academy Awards. You know, they, they want that. Of course they do. But if, particularly with documentaries, I tend to think, at least at the heart of them, it's to have as many people see them and be as educated by them as possible. So if you can find a way to get it out there uh, in distribution, that's not easy, but that really is the end goal. So you're seeing a lot more docs now jumping directly from the festi festival circuit. They might be doing a quick qualifying run if they are interested in the awards, and then going directly to Netflix, Amazon, <coughs> PBS, wherever it is, in order to have that distribution. So. I think there's certainly a market for it. It's probably even bigger than it ever was, but it's not um, It's not going to make you any money. <laughs> what about you for, for, Mike, for Mike and Keith? Uh, do you ever see, after the fact, um, <coughs> sort of using a, a documentary that somehow may fit one of your client's message, is using it for branded entertainment, even again, if it if it you know you found it after it was completed, I'm not necessarily sure. After the fact, we have four brands absolutely worked with directors to create long form docu style content um, in a non advertising sort of way. Um, I can't think off the top of my head of an example where we've taken a documentary after the fact and repurposed it for a brand. What about you, Keith? We've, I think the furthest we've gone is something was shot and was in edit, um, and so there was the ability to do some shaping. Um, but I wouldn't be opposed to seeing something that was fully baked if it made sense for a brand, of course. 
Um, I can't think off the top of my head, but definitely we've had documentaries um, on a couple of occasions that have been shot and are in production, and they've come in in the edit process, sometimes because we need money to finish the edit process, um, sometimes because we think there's a really, well, always because we think there's a good fit. Um, and, and so then there's still some shaping that can be done. Yeah, I mean, it, it, really, it really depends on the subject. And we've had, um, you know, brands and foundations come in at various stages of, you know, the production process or post-production process and, um, you know, be part of the film. You know, I think if it's, if it's a Holocaust documentary or something, like, you're not going to get any brands to really fund that. But certainly, like, a nonprofit foundation or, you know, you know there's a lot of sort of benefactors and things like that, that that are involved in, you know, the doc film scene. So it, it really depends on subject matter. And Tribeca has the whole branded film. I can't remember. It's Tribeca X, I think. Um, so, like, that is a burgeoning area for brands, um, and I'm a huge believer in it. Yeah, there's, I mean, they're usually, they're buying, um, being part of, like, finished products. Like, I know Gatorade, again, did the, um, the Rugby Boys of Memphis and some different things that's going to become a full, it was a short, they, they're usually shorts on that side, like 20 minutes or less, and then um, that's going to become a full, le they're funding a full length uh, feature doc on that, so um, yeah, it really is, you know, depending on what the subject is, I think. Someone in this area had their hand up, um, several folks, why don't we go way up there, dude with the hat, there's a mic coming to you. Hi, um, a friend uh, who's a creative director in New York is saying that uh, six second commercials are really what clients are uh, asking for a lot. And I, I have been in the business a while, but um, I'm curious, is that effective? The six second spots or six second pieces of content? The short answer is, is yes. It's, it's one of the reasons why there's more and more demand for them, why you're hearing from clients or friends that people are asking for them. You know, what's happening in the world is our attention spans are getting shorter in terms of what we're able to process and digest. So the challenge for creators is how can you tell a quick and powerful story or send a quick and powerful message in a shorter amount of time? So when you look at a Snap ad on Snapchat, you might have their recommendations to do it under three seconds. Um, and, uh, and it is effective in the sense that that's about the amount of time you're gonna have someone's attention to begin with, so you better be impactful and, and move them on to the call, call to action. What do you think? I agree, I mean, I think context is the key, right? So Burger King um, did some six second ads within YouTube um, based on what people were searching for. I can't remember exactly what they're searching for. I think it was like shark attacks or like some weird sort of thing where you'd never think that Burger King would be a part of that. Um, and so there really was no context. But they <coughs> associated six second ads with two guys in a booth talking about the new Whopper or the chicken sandwich or whatever it is. I, I think <laughs> the sort of shock and sort of uh, uh, humor that comes with something like that certainly works. I think like where you're just, you're not looking for a six second piece of content. Like that's not what somebody's looking for. But I think in the context of YouTube where you're bookending it and you can have some fun with it either through search or, or whatever it might be. Yeah, I think it can work, absolutely. I don't think there's, uh, there, there's no reason why it can't. Well, and I think, I mean, I'm not, I don't live in the kind of more marketing world. But I think to that end, it also depends on what the goal of it is. If we're talking about brand awareness, you can raise brand awareness in six seconds. Can you tell a compelling story to sell a product? Maybe not. But if you're doing this in a consistent, you know, prolific manner that is raising awareness of that brand, then you kind of have the opportunity to go back to those consumers again, maybe with a longer story or a bigger pitch for a product. And there's ways to push the envelope. Um, IKEA just did, has done their sort of... <laughs> unbelievably boring, so they put it into skippable ads, and it's some of the most boring, so there's a guy, wash, a Swedish guy washing dishes, and he's speaking in Swedish saying, you really don't want to watch this, you really don't want to, and the time of viewing is through the roof. Geico did some Geico funny, did the yeah, I mean, yeah. classic stuff, right? So like, I, I have a little bit of fun with it, and I oh, think in the context of six seconds or skippable or whatever it might be, that's where you're gonna get some stickiness out of it. Yeah, and I, I also think it's like coming in knowing you need a six second ad up front. I got, I'm not in the ad world, but like, 
we'll do these different shorts or things like that, and they'll be like, oh, we need a 30-second version. We need a six-second version. Well, like, tell us at the beginning right. rather than say, hey, cut this down, and you're, you're never going to get it right if, you, if that's the approach yeah, you think take. Think of like, it as a cut down is almost just. Yeah, you yeah. got you to think about the platform. Where are they seeing it? Where's, you know, what's the audience expectation? And then you know, what the call to action. But you, you know, having that all kind of laid out up front is always important, I think. Thanks. Great. Uh, other questions? Other questions? Yeah, right in front. Yep. Hi there. Uh, all this content avenue is wonderful, and all these different avenues are wonderful, but well, I'm thinking of Geico, for instance. It's like they never tell you what they are, what they sell, what the product is. I mean, I know it's insurance, but um, when you're talking six-second ads, three-second ads, you are bringing up brand awareness, but you're not really telling anybody what the product is, how good the product is. Um, and the other thing is, how do you keep from offending or making uh, what you're doing intrusive? Um, I'll give you an example. I walk into Best Buy, and the next thing I know, I go home, and my phone, uh, I go onto Facebook, and all of a sudden, all the ads are miraculously from Best Buy. Now, did I leave my Bluetooth on, and they're tracking me? Uh, yes. I'll click on, <laughs> I'll go to, yes, I know. Yeah. I'll go to Best Buy, or not Best Buy, uh, B&H. I'm a camera guy, so I, I go to their website. The next thing I know, everything on the internet is B&H. Yeah. And at what point does that become something that offends or in, is intrusive or pushes me away as opposed to bringing me in? Yeah. Because I know they're watching me. I know that you know everything I do is being tracked. Um, and when you're trying to push content and do it in such a way that you're not pushing people away as opposed to getting people to come in. Yeah, I mean, that's where I like to make the distinction between ads and content. I think in, the, in your instance with, was it B&H? Yes. Um, they're retargeting you, right? And so they, it's cookie-based usually. They know that you've gone onto the site and then they're tracking you within social media uh, in a lot of ways and, and other places and spaces. So it's a pixel that they're putting up and it's usually a banner ad. Um, and I see the purpose behind it because they think they've gotten you close to purchase and then they're just gonna inundate you with it over and over again. It's a frequency play. Um, I don't, I, I like on the intrusive thing, if I had the answer to that, I think I'd be rich. Um, you're, you're bringing up the classic effective or creepy case. When done well, yeah. retargeting through, you know, what's called sequential storytelling can be done very effectively. And so typically the strategy to do it is you start first with a more classic piece of content that generates interest in the brand, and then you retarget with um, harder hitting, more product messages to really bring that person um, down the journey into the purchase life cycle. That's generally the objective around it. I wanna kind of flip the question and ask you, you had said that you know, despite of the lack of product messaging in the Geico ads, that they're an insurance company. How did you know that? So they say it at the very end, um, when, you, when you're in the market to, and they're not a client by the way, when you're in the market to consider insurance, uh, who are you gonna consider? <laughs> yeah. They have great Swedish meatballs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, if, if you know, it is that early in time and you say it is just a really good product yeah. that can be really good, then maybe it is a good one to consider. <coughs> Yep, and you know, again, not speaking for them, I suspect that that's one element to their strategy is to canvas the landscape to be able to create top of mind awareness. Yeah. So that when you are in the market for insurance, you'll say, oh yeah, Geico, you know, in a, in a bit of a subconscious subliminal way. That, but that's just one piece of their strategy. Other questions, we have time for two more. Let's do all the way in the front. We'll make our mic guy walk a little bit, get, get his cardio in. Domi just described is sometimes uh, considered a, uh, a benefit when in fact it was in providing legislation that would do that because you now have ads that are directed towards your interests. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering um, in this increasingly PC world, 
your alignment from your clients to content that they may be in the future becoming more sensitive to uh, and that other um, users or, or, or uh, people who are watching this, uh, they begin to watch where you're playing those ads and having a, a different opinion of your client depending on what content they're associated with. And how much of that is a concern moving forward? So your question, just so just making sure I understand, is based upon where a consumer might be viewing that piece of content. Well, the idea is that uh, you said you always you, you get inundated with ads. You get inundated with ads, and that's not he's not sure. saying that's beneficial to them. I think that there's a, there's a growing number of, of of people who are wary as to the content that you advertise on sure. says something about your brand. Absolutely. And is that an increasing uh, uh, of interest to your clients? Are you getting any pushback from them? No, no doubt. I, I mean, look, uh, ultimately, what a brand should be caring about is everything that they put out into the world, be it content or utility, tools, help, it should be aligned to what their brand promise is and what they stand for as a company and as a brand. That's what they should be doing, and it should be matched <coughs> to that brand platform. They should be living and breathing what that promise is. So by all means, their advertising should also reflect that. But I think like YouTube had a mishap where I think some of their content was exposed, uh, or I can't remember what it was. There was something pornographic in nature that happened. Um, and a lot of brands, including some of ours that we represent, ran away and took a hiatus and said, until Google can figure it out, we're not going to be present yeah. Um, uh, yeah. on there. And, and so I think a brand has every right. I think the other thing is, in this world of influencers or creators creating on behalf of brands, you've got to be careful there too, right? Like not only should they be synergistic with, with the brand just from a <clears throat> an overall sort of attitudinal standpoint, um, but they need to need to make sure that from a PR standpoint, um, there's nothing, ha there, there isn't anything funny happening. So there's just so much more to, to worry about and, and take into account um, these days when you're pushing marketing out. Yeah, no, I mean, I think brand safety is a huge issue. And, you know, when you look at the platforms or, you know, you listen to some of the testimony that they're, you know, around the Russian, you know, influence on the election and things like that. And it seems like every time the Facebook general counsel comes out, there's, oh, now it's 100, this ad was seen by 150 million people and it was 100K spend and things like that. I don't know how much, I think people are trusting the platforms a lot less. And I don't think most people realize how much information they're sharing with mm -hmm. the platforms. And, um, you know, they're, 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 no matter what Google or Facebook say they are, they're, they're advertising platforms. That's where all of their revenue comes from. So it's, you know, it's a question based on each, you know, each person kind of has to say, I, I trust them or I don't trust them or the, you know, the value that Google Maps or Facebook newsfeed provides me outweighs the, the, the giving up of my privacy at a certain level. This has been awesome, guys. It's 4.05, so we're going to wrap up and make sure that you can continue with your Saturday evenings. Go outside, have a drink, put an extra pineapple on your fruity drink, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Thanks so much. <laughs>